on this week's Rent Wars, we discuss the impossible President-elect Donald Trump, and we discuss the arrogance that made this result seem impossible. The media has been discussing its failure in polls, and even as they're discussing their failure, uh, you can hear the contempt they have for these people that they blame for Donald Trump's uh, election, his winning the election. But even in their analysis is a contempt, a, a sort of disgust for these people, and they're they're being stereotyped. You know, if if you're a white guy who isn't college educated, you'd think you're the worst thing on the planet. Uh, of course, there are Klansmen, there are white people who are racist and bad, but there are a lot of highly educated racists and they're well uh, well to do racists. Obviously, Donald Trump was well to do. Um, but I, even he doesn't count as racist compared to some of these people. And the question is, is what's going on? How could they get it so wrong? And how to keep from getting it wrong in the future? And even more important, from getting bamboozled. Uh, because I think if you look at it, Donald Trump uh, won the presidency uh, in part because... Clinton supporters were complacent. They were, you know, already racking up their first woman president, uh, you know, paraphernalia and a lot of different things. Um, but there is uh, some <coughs> discussion to be had about uh, what's going on and where the media uh, went wrong. And, I, I, you know, I obviously like the New York Times. The New York Times is very reliable, balanced. It's not perfect, and they have their biases, but in general, even through their bias, you can sort of read the truth. And their own polling uh, was absurd. It was completely off the mark that there was an 80% chance that Hillary would win, 89%, and by the end of the night, 98% chance that Trump would win. And you have to say, well, something's wrong with these odds. You know, if this was a casino, uh, you know, the, the casino would have went bankrupt. The first thing is that they say that Trump voters voted for themselves. Well, I agree with that. They, they weren't really voting for Trump. They were voting for the fact that he was, he was noticing them and talking about their concerns. You know, when you say, oh, it's no big deal, the factory's closed, you mean all the jobs for a particular town, everyone now loses their house, and the factory goes to Mexico or China or somewhere else, and they say, oh, it's no big deal because um, the, it'll, it'll be made up somewhere else. Uh, we'll give you retraining. Well, but that's a lie. It's a complete and total lie. We know that any jobs that require training, the comp these greedy corporations are bringing in people with H-1 visas to do the work for half the price, and half the time those jobs are going uh, overseas as well. Uh, and even if they aren't, they're bringing people from overseas to take the job because they don't want Americans. They don't want people who have worked here and who have the ability to put the kibosh on their greed by voting. And strangely enough, uh, voting for this really rich real estate guy seems to be the way that they've made it known okay so today I'm going to give you my theories as to how Donald Trump won this and also what went wrong with the polling and generally just what's going wrong how did Donald Trump win what should be the Democratic base? What's always been the Democratic base? How did he win Wisconsin? It's because of contempt for the backbone of the Democratic Party, which is the working class. That's my theory. Uh, and Trump, however imperfectly, the Teflon Don that he is, and I mean 
Boy, is he Teflon. That grabbing genitals thing, that's a hell of a thing to come back from. Number one, I think the Supreme Court opening is what really put the heat on the Republicans to definitely not lose this one. Donald Trump didn't have a good ground operation. He didn't have any of the normal stuff. If he'd had it, this would have been a complete blowout of Clinton, in my opinion, because I know individuals, you know, they don't like to admit it, but they're Trump supporters who forgot to go out to the polls to vote. And, you know, it's not that they're racist. These are Caucasian males I'm talking about, but they're not racist. One, in fact, has a wife and a child with a Asian female. He's a proud supporter of President Obama. He likes Obama, but he despises Hillary Clinton, and it's not misogyny. His wife despises Hillary Clinton. I'm going to go into that with my theories as to why. I, I like Hillary Clinton. I've supported Hillary Clinton for years. I like the Clintons. I don't like everything they do, but I do like them. And I remember that they brought attention to the black community, real attention and real respect for our institutions when everyone else was ignoring us. But that's just me. So the Supreme Court issue, we'll go into that even a little more because I feel that that has a lot to do with this uh, gender-neutral bathroom thing where anyone who feels female can go into a bathroom and any state that disagrees with that, like North Carolina did, will be sanctioned. It obviously also reflects on religious discrimination, uh, which I'll get into, and fair immigration. When you go from beyond liberal to absurdly left-wing, the danger of that is, is that you swing too far and everyone pushes back. We're going to get to that. First, let's talk about the turnout. It was a low turnout election. Uh, had it been a higher turnout election, ironically, I believe that it would have been in Trump's favor. But a number of Hillary supporters felt like there's no need to worry. Why worry? Why should I worry when Hillary has an 89% chance of winning uh, we're just going to plan a party in her honor. We're not going to actually go show up and vote or volunteer. And all of these protests that are coming, you know, you don't protest after the election. Your, your protest should have been, especially when you were voting uh, and, and trying to elect the front runner, your protest should be that you were actually out there volunteering and doing all the hard work. But that's not how people feel. It's like an entitlement. Well, I don't like the result. And ironically, that's the thing that the Trump supporters threatening to do. That you know, we're going, well, that's just childish. It's not how a democracy works. So one of the things is that this illusion of inevitability killed the ardor of people who were going to rush and run and fight and make sure to get out and vote because it felt like, well, if she's got an 89% margin, she doesn't really need my vote. And the media is to blame for that. So I call that media turnout suppression. A second area I think was very outrageous is racist stereotypes. Now, you would think I'm talking about the racist stereotypes of some of these Trump supporters. He, he had the endorsement of the Ku Klux Klan. Obviously, that's not a good endorsement to have. He didn't repudiate them. He didn't do the, the standard things politicians do. But to say that all white people, lower class or middle class white people, are the same as Klansmen is racist. It's a stereotype. This individual has his Asian wife, and he's a proud Obama supporter, but he hated Hillary. A lot of this goes to Hillary. She represents this nonstop chain, uh, which I'll go into next. So they had something where, like in Pennsylvania, they were able to show that areas that went for Obama by like 9% margin went for Trump by 12% margin. 
in in some of these rural Pennsylvania areas. And Pennsylvania is Klan country. Why were they voting for Obama? Well, because it's not really Klan country. There's some Klan there. But you don't paint everybody with the brush of their least respected members. Many blacks and Hispanics supported Trump. In certain areas, Trump had as much as 39% of the Hispanic vote. What's that about? Well, if I'm Hispanic and I'm here legally and I jump through all the hoops that are required to be here legally and you let someone cut the line and they're on equal standing with me because they just crossed a fence. Yeah, they may be Hispanic too, but don't paint all Hispanics in the same way. It's racist. So there's this racist stereotype. Well, all Hispanics are going to be upset because... You want to put controls on immigration. Well, that's not true. Quite a few Hispanics, and apparently the voting shows this, felt that, hey, you know, not the majority, but quite a few. I mean, 40% is a respectable minority. Wouldn't you agree? It's almost half when you push it certain ways. If more people thought about it, agreed with Trump. So they supported him. But there are other issues, too. I mean, maybe there are Hispanics who have guns and want to keep their guns because they live in a neighborhood that's dangerous. They've got their legal guns, and they don't want you taking them away because you've got, you know, these these uh, South American gangs going around killing people willy-nilly. If I have my gun, they can't kill me, at least not without a fight. So black uh, turnout and support of Trump was less, you know, you got to say that the fact that there's any black support, and I mean any above the 1% to get in there and, and, you know, press the wrong lever, or fill out the wrong button, uh, is quite amazing for a guy who's been endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. However, what's interesting is, is Trump did not really applaud the endorsement. It's a strange, cagey thing. He is not a professional politician, and I think that has helped him in his Teflon Donness. I mean, it's unbelievable. And yet he had black support, not just in rural places, here in New York as well, which actually surprised me. But he had some black support. You know, he was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, he was found guilty of racial discrimination for uh, keeping blacks out of his housing, blah, blah, blah. And yet he manages to maintain black support. And strangely enough, even after the endorsement of the Ku Klux Klan, he actually wooed the black community to some limited degree, which is quite amazing for a guy coming from where he's coming from. So, I, you know, I think that there are a lot of racist stereotypes within the liberal wing of the Democratic Party. It's just they want to put you in a box. You are Hispanic. Therefore, you have no right to your own opinion. Only white people have the right to their own opinion. It's unbelievable. This is one of the big problems. Uh, there's also you know, new voters coming on board and low turnout. Painting all lower class and middle class white people as racist is racist. It's just not fair. Especially in these areas that voted Obama overwhelmingly. You, you, you just got to say, well, wait a minute. That's just uh, bizarre. Now, fatigue is number three. And the fatigue I'm talking about is since the early 1990s, even before the 90s, it's been Bush, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Clinton. I think that over all this time, it felt like these two dynasties continuing in control of their parties and controlling the future and controlling everything. So whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're really sick of hearing Clinton and Bush all the time. And even I feel some of that. I mean, the excitement of 2001 and way back when when she was running, when Hillary was one, running for Senate, totally different from now. It just feels like, ugh. You know, it, it felt dredged, and it's not her fault. It's just people want new, and we saw that happen to her against Obama, and we saw that happen 
to Jeb Bush against Trump and then Trump against Clinton again. It was enough. No more Bush, no more Clinton. We don't have dynasties. These aren't inherited positions. These are elected positions based on theoretical merit. A big part of this, I feel, is just, uh, especially when you're hurting. I mean, you're hurting because these things, you, you're just not being listened to. And this free trade killing all the jobs and the immigration killing all the jobs, they're going, oh no, everything's fine. I mean, it's just enough. You guys get out. We need someone new. Particularly someone new who's saying, I'm going to cut all these stupid deals where all the jobs go to China and all the jobs go to Mexico. There's this group called Primus, and they're focused on lower class white people generally. And they have this song called Everything's Made in China, and that's all they sing through the whole thing. Sounds like hillbillies let loose. And they're going, everything's made in China. Everything's made in, and they swear, China. Everything's made in freaking China. This has been building, 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 building for years. This this constant feeling that the jobs are being taken away. And then the big joke is they say, oh, but you can get Chinese stuff cheaper. Yeah, but some of the Chinese stuff is maybe a 50-cent can opener, but when you try to use it, it snaps. Or you squeeze it to break the can open, and instead of the can opening, the can opener breaks. I mean, it's this illusion of these completely out of touch economists. Number four is fair immigration. Any job they didn't send overseas, like these wonderful manufacturing jobs that built the middle class, they sent them all overseas. So now there's some jobs over here. Any jobs that they weren't able to send overseas, so the illegal immigrants are now able to come in and they work for less because they're illegal. So they don't enforce their rights because they're afraid of being deported. And we have laws against that. We have laws that our judges refuse to enforce. This federal law, the racketeering law, has always outlawed these immigration crimes. And and not just the people sneaking over, but the coyotes and you know the immigration scammers. And you know, we had this massive one here in New York called the Snake, Snakehead or something uh, in Chinatown where like millions of illegal Chinese have come over and all of them take jobs. And if you have a job and you, you, you got a job and they're telling you, well, yeah, so your job was taken by an illegal alien or rather we should say undocumented to be politically correct. They tell you, well, just grin and bear it because it's jobs Americans don't want. Well, the American who had it wanted it, <laughs> and if he didn't want it, he would have quit. So what happens is, is this continuous contempt for everyone hurting from uh, this abuse, you know. And when you're saying there are these people who've been here, who followed the rules, they're being cheated by people who cut the line. Nobody likes it when someone cuts the line. And it erodes the fabric. And the people who follow the rules, chances are they're citizens now. And they're not happy about people being able to cut the line and not go through the hoops they had to go through. And to follow the procedures they had to go through. In addition, it's a crime. So breaking in through the border is a crime. It's a criminal enterprise. You are a criminal when you do it. They can paint it every which way they want. But what it really is, is this was a Republican thing. This was set up by Ronald Reagan. Turn a blind eye to immigration crimes. That's from Ronald Reagan. I speak from experience as a person in the federal government at that time charged with enforcing those laws. All of this has then been picked up by the Democrats, but the people who benefit are these rich corporations. We have laws. If you hire an illegal alien, you are supposed to be charged with racketeering. That means you get tribal damages, the immigration crimes themselves, $10,000 fine for each illegal alien found on your premises for each month, whatever, blah, 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 blah. They're supposed to pay it. The employers. But the employers don't. And that's the wink wink of it all. See, that's why the Republicans were for it. It's a great way of union busting and it's worked wonders. 
Now, what happens is they say, well, these are jobs that don't require education. Well, they thought of that one, too, and it's called the H-1 visa. The uh, New York Times did a big series on Disney's violation of the abuse of the H-1 visas and abuse of H-1 visas in general. What Disney did was... You know, there are a group of people working in their data center, like hundreds of people, and they had a bunch of people from Pakistan come walk in one day and said, train them in your job, train them to do your job. And they said, oh, okay, now that you've trained these Pakistani people with their H-1 visas, you're all fired. <laughs> the outrage of it. And, you know, you said, oh, well, the immigration problem is only for people without education. No, this corporate greed has gotten way out of hand, and Trump speaks to that, and he spoke to it, and he won because of it. It's everybody is in danger. And in fact, even lawyers are in danger because they have outsourced legal work to India, and it's actually easy to do and cheap. So that is number four, fair immigration. Number five. North Carolina is an example of number five, the overwhelming uh, social engineering and Stepford wifeification of, and politically correct domination of this entire country. In North Carolina, they voted, put into law uh, a rule that said no one not of the same gender go into another gender's bathroom. That doesn't seem too extreme. Here in New York, we've had gender-neutral bathroom laws and principles and policies in place for at least 10 years, for over a decade. But most police don't know that. And if a guy is caught creeping around in, in a woman's bathroom, you know, they'll, they'll pull him out, whatever, and probably arrest him. But down in North Carolina, because they made this their official policy and said, you definitely cannot do this, this became a flashpoint. And instead of saying, well, look, that's North Carolina, there was this giant boycott, they cut all the student loans. So these are the students who actually support that particular uh, worldview of allowing anyone who feels like it to go into any bathroom they feel like. And they punish the students. So basically the people being punished, the poor students who rely on federal money to go to college. And they also began boycotting the NCAA, all these things where the education department would push all of these things. This is throughout the whole country where, for instance, at Harvard uh, University, the soccer team had, you know, some comments uh, where they were rating the female soccer players, the male soccer team. So they they slam it as, oh, that's, you're beastly, and they cut the whole soccer team. Meanwhile, if it was women, they would have they said, oh, well, that's what girls do. They like to rate the boys, you know, and say which one's hot and which one's not. So this extreme sort of social engineering and extreme bias against men and bias against social norms uh, has struck with a vengeance. So President Obama won North Carolina, and after he won North Carolina, this whole flashpoint came up. And North Carolina is basically a, uh, a Republican state, and what happened is is this time around Hillary Clinton lost in the double digits. And this thing about the gender-neutral bathrooms isn't just preference, it's about safety. And if a guy can lurk in the women's bathroom, and if the police come and he goes, well, I was feeling feminine today, I was feeling pretty, they go, oh, well, that's legal then. That is a safety issue, and people go, oh, well, that's ridiculous, no one would ever do that. Well, that's just absurd. And there's an absurdity to people's ignoring other people's concerns of safety and you know it's like someone with a you know covered in gasoline striking matches going oh it's no problem to strike matches nothing ever happens it's stupid and it came back and blew up on Hillary Clinton's campaign now we have one last issue number six religious discrimination and intolerance against Christians 
Now, we respect every other religion in this country, but we attack the very tradition, religious tradition that brings about our sense of freedom. Our country was based on Christian values and a, a blend of different forms of Christianity. And the very tradition that they're based on, and mind you, it's not perfect, uh, are under constant unrelenting attack. If you criticize any other religion in this country, the government will come down on you like a like a like a ton of bricks. But if you attack Christianity, you know, it's it's any anything goes. And I think this has hit a nerve in middle America and a lot of other places too. So for example Rudy Giuliani versus the Brooklyn Museum, you know, oh, religion versus art. Rudy, Gi Rudy Giuliani was outraged by a picture of the Virgin Mary done in dung. You know, they've had pictures of Jesus as, as piss. All these other things and, and worse stuff. Well, we're not even going to go into everything they've done. But you do it in any other religion it's called to any other religion it's called intolerance and you're a bigot and et cetera et cetera so the liberal tradition of supporting art doesn't attack these other religions it only attacks this one religion and the outrage of only attacking one religion actually of attacking any religion is absurd it's it's outrageous and there's no limit to it, and it's applauded, and it's government-sponsored. The government pays for these attacks. And, of course, attacking religion allows you to do anything you want. You can be George Orwell, uh, uh, the Brave New World, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. You can be anything you want. Um, 1984, George Orwell's 1984, you can meld the society where people are basically robots, where you've broken down every social convention, where people are suffering, suffering and suffering alone, and you medicate them with these government-approved uh, quackery medications. <sighs> well, so hopefully uh, you, you, you agree with some of my points. Please, whether you agree or not, leave a comment and let me know. Uh, I'd really love to hear what you think on my take and or are there things that have missed that you think are more important uh, or do you think that have misread something please go to rentwars.com and leave a comment thanks for watching rent wars see you next week